Well, the last step, the last resort, when you actually elevate, uh, subordinated everything to bottleneck, you exploit the bottleneck and you don't have any other ideas how to improve your bottleneck, the only last way is to elevate the bottleneck. Is to actually increase a number, make a clones, right, or hire extra developers, add extra machines to increase performance of the bottleneck. And this is actually is not free. The first two exploit the bottleneck and uh, subordinate everything to the bottleneck, kind of free. The, this one is not free. But usually, everyone is taking this step before there's those two. And that's why uh, usually improvements are cost, not cost efficient. How can we elevate bottleneck? We actually add in more people, we give people training, we provide coaching and mentoring, we hold retrospective, and we improve workspace and processes. So every time you do such a things, you're actually elevating your bottleneck. Again, elevation is a, in real life, it's a last resort, because it's expensive. It costs time and money, it's not free. Plus, moreover, every time you change your system, it's like this liner. You are changing the course of this liner, and it has inertia. And remember the, about those six levels of resistance, you face with some of them or all of them, and this actually can make your improvements fail. So, at the beginning, once you implement the elevation of a bottleneck, you will have negative effects. You know about that. If you're taking a new uh, developer or tester in your team, performance of the entire team goes down at the beginning, right? And you need to know what will happen, and then, and how to manage a proven system. Because, again, if you don't understand what you're doing and what will lead, where will lead this improvement, you will actually look for troubles and you will find them. And the last step is actually to repeat the cycle. But again, uh, not repeat cycle uh, blindlessly. You need to re-examine if the goal is still valid. Your goal might change. Right? The next thing, you need to re-identify the bottleneck. Because after the improvement, a bottleneck usually moves from the testers to developers, from developers to the designers, from designers to product owners, or even to the marketing department. And it doesn't make sense to improve the developers if bottleneck in the sales. Keep improving uh, is never ending process. And there is always a way to do better, but there is no substitution to knowledge. And usually, once we found a good improvement, right? We know the goal, we found the bottleneck, and we made improvement, and then we continue improving this over and over again. And this is actually called inertia. So don't let inertia become the constraint. It means, well, last time we improved this and this worked really great, we keep, keep improving this. But actually it's no longer a bottleneck and you're actually dealing with inertia. And uh, just do not uh, fall in that trap. Okay, and uh, if you're improving your system or building a new system, you can actually design where to place your bottleneck. It's uh, one of the interesting aha. So, if you know that the bottleneck is the most important part of the system, and uh, every organization is subordinate to the bottleneck, right? then you want to control the bottleneck. If you're a manager or developer or tester, you want uh, that your department is a bottleneck, then you can actually improve your performance and your entire organization by improving performance of your team. And this is a tough task because if your uh, client doesn't understand this, right, then it has low, uh, low effect on the overall performance of organization. But if you have this power or control, you can place the bottleneck in the area where you full, have full control and focus, right? and you keep it under your control, so you can actually improve continuously. And this made a huge effect on the entire organization. And again, improving non-bottleneck has a low effect. So, uh, when you're designing the system, you can pick a bottleneck, for example, a development department as a bottleneck, it's a, it's a nice bottleneck. 
Then the identify potential bottleneck in the nearest future, for example, marketing and uh, test department. And before improving the bottleneck of the developers, right, hiring a new developer or a couple of developers, you might want to increase capacity of the non-bottlenecks before you increase in the performance of the bottleneck. In this case, your liner will keep going in the same directions without making any change in course and you're fully in control of the bottleneck. For example, how it means in the real life. If client tells you, I need a, an extra developer, right? And uh, first question that I ask him, okay, show me the pipeline for the de developer. I need to see the evidences that this developer will have a lot of work to do, or the team will have a lot of work to do. Otherwise, I will not agree on this solution to increase the performance of the development team if I do not see the value, right? So I'm trying to find confirmation that the other areas of the organization will still performing better, right, than the development organization. So that sales can sell more than de developers can produce, right? Or market can buy more than developers can produce. Okay, let's look to the practical application of the theory of constraint. Uh, here I will show you the case about uh, utilization of peak resources for elastic teams. Sometimes uh, we have a team of developers and we have a peak loads when we need extra manpower for the short period of time, couple of weeks up to one month, where we need to deliver some functionality to the critical deadline. For example, exhibition or a show, whatever. For example, we have a background. A new small but strong team of senior developers, mature developers, started. And team was running for three, two, three weeks from the beginning. So the pretty quick start. And client came up with a major milestone exhibition in the Copenhagen area. And this exhibition cannot be rescheduled because the developers are slow, right? It's outside of our control. So we need to meet the deadline, other or do not go to the exhibition. Also, we had seven years old evolving legacy code in our hands. So it's a pretty challenging task. But the good positive thing is that product owner trusted a lot to development teams and the guys were pretty mature and pretty senior. The challenge was that from the very beginning we knew that existing resources not sufficient to meet the deadline. First, code base is unknown and legacy code and no solid documentation or training materials. So it's kind of mission impossible. What we did, first, we verified the goal with the, with the customer, with the client. So we focused on the one goal, Everything which is needed for exhibition release, Copenhagen exhibition release. What is else, just throw it away. So we knew our goal, it was pretty clear. The next step, we identified the bottleneck. In this case, it was pretty natural. The developers were bottleneck because they had a lot of stuff to do on their plate. And this was stuff which actually needed to be delivered by the Copenhagen exhibition release. Next step, what we did next, we exploit the bottleneck. We clarified priorities and aggressively cut the feature set for that exhibition. So it was a, actually a long meetings, not development, but long meetings with the client to make sure that we have a minimal list of requirements which we need to deliver. Not all nice to have, but must do have, okay? Plus, the overall spirit was pretty high and developers themselves suggested to work overtime. At the same time, I agreed with the customer that uh, the rate will be attractive for the developers who work in overtime. So we exploit the bottleneck as much as we can. And uh, we also installed some kind of countdown on the, on the board, like uh, five days left till the end, five, four, three days, so it gave a good feeling of urgency for the development team. And it was still not enough to meet the deadline. So uh, then we subordinated everything to the bottleneck. We removed all work which is not related to Copenhagen release from uh, developers' eyes completely. They don't see anything except Copenhagen release. All focuses including customers and sales on only what's in developer hands. 
then we looked to the work we have in the bottleneck and tried to find the way how we can parallel, how we can develop in parallel the work which need to be done. Well, uh, we contacted the Ausher. Do you know Ausher? Who knows Ausher? Only a few people. Ausher is a head of peak resources department. She can help your teams actually to find the professional who can uh, reinforce your team in the short period of time with the freelancers. And we did this, we take, took this option for our case and we succeeded. How we did this? Uh, first, we found that we have a design, PSD design, which can be rendered to HTML by a freelancer. And we decided to hire a freelancer for a couple of weeks to make this happen. Right? We had a pretty clear expectation for the freelancer. We call this elastic part of the team. Uh, who was actually doing this work for us according to our guidelines, right? And this uh, freelancer was not isolated from the developers. They had in one chat, sitting in one uh, virtual room and communicating on every single uh, change which he needed to de deliver to us. So we got successful, successfully meet the critical milestone and the exhibition went pretty fine. And even so, we didn't stop our improvements. Right? We had a next goal, actually, for the next release. Uh, we need to deliver a new design for the new part of the websites for the customer. And we see that we had freelancer will not help us. Because there is a lot of domain knowledge which we need to gain. And we decided to elevate the bottleneck. We hire a middle developer, expanded core team. And we are building long-term relationship with the freelancers, right? So whenever we need him, he is on the distance of the hand, and he can join us and help us. And we invested time and uh, money into investigating an existing code base. So it was elevation of the bottleneck. And next, uh, in the step number five, we actually verify our current state and uh, make a retrospectives to see how improvements help us to get better in our bottleneck, in our development. And all the time uh, we are taking a new part of work, we decide what we can do, what we can delegate to elastic part of the team or freelancer, or what we cannot delegate. And based on these uh, options, we actually distribute our work. And our next steps is actually uh, still keep the bottleneck in the development team. For example, a customer hired a new sales manager in the United Kingdom, right? And this was a, a sign for us that the bottleneck will still stay in the development team and we can, can actually expand if client wants. And we are currently uh, looking for a senior PHP developer in Denver Uh We're also refining, uh, going to refine criteria when we need to work, send work to the freelancer. Because usually agile methods tells us it's better to keep uh, the knowledge inside of the team but sometimes it's not a really an option because we have a tough deadline we need to deliver and we need to find the non-trivial way how to do it and that's why we invest in time and money into getting our freelancers up to speed yes and we have long-term relationships what does it mean if a freelancer fails we tell him that fails and let him to improve his performance we are not changing the freelancer we are staying with this a good uh, professional and let him to improve his performance. But if he fails continuously, we're actually changing him. So this is important. Not change freelancer just after the first fail. Give him a way to improve. What we learned the lessons? Well, we took responsibility for the freelancers in front of the customer. Customer don't have to do anything about the freelancers. It's our responsibility. We are sending work to the freelancer, so to the elastic part of the team, if only it can be split. It doesn't require serious domain knowledge or legacy code base knowledge. And if uh, integration time of the results produced by freelancer is much less than development by the core developers. For example, if we have work for two hours, right, for the freelancer, but integration will take one hour, it's better to keep this work in, in development team, core development team. But if uh, uh, work for freelancers for 40 hours, but integration will take four hours, we will delegate this to freelancer. 
if there is a no steady pipeline for the freelancer to become a part of our team. Next lessons that, yeah, freelancer need to know that we do care about him and we need him, not just kind of a temporary resource to use it and throw it away, no. We are building long relationships with him and we, will, we are going to increase this elastic part of the team for our needs. And yeah, trust is everything. We have a trust with the freelancer, we have a trust with our customers and we are making amazing things which are never done before. Uh, I can give you a small example that uh, the guys actually decided to go to mobile platform and the client approved and bought the MacBooks for them, for the PHP developers. So they can, in spare time, actually uh, play with the MacBooks and uh, create some ad hoc iPhone applications. It's because we have a high trust from the customer. And we are always trying to maximize our throughput. We have an interesting debate inside of the team, uh, discussion if we need a developer, if we don't need a developer, and consider a lot of different options. First, to find a way how to improve the throughput. Theory of constraints is not only five focusing steps, it's much bigger than that. And uh, this question to you, what is the most common universal tool for making problem solving, decision making or implementing improvement? I hope that this brain is, uh, your brain is the most universal tool. Sometimes we use a hammer if we have a policies, right? Sometimes we are so creative we cannot really focus on what we need to do. We have these kind of tools. Or sometimes we are bored and we just uh, making a guess. But theory of constraints asks you to use your brain's logical thinking to improve your organization. What is this all about? It, ca it has so-called thinking processes. It's a logical uh, graphs or charts which you can build in order to represent your current reality, called current reality tree in you know, order to get a better understanding of what to change, then you can build the evaporating cloud, a conflict resolution diagram. This is about solving conflicts. It's not only applicable to your work, it's applicable to your family, to your business, to any areas of your life. Where you have a conflict, this tool can help you to solve this conflict, even independently from all other tools. Then, when you, once you found what you need to change, you go and build a future reality tree which will show you uh, how your future will look like once you implemented the solution. Again, using logical thinking processes, not just uh, guessing. Once you know what to change, right, you want to make sure that your solution will actually work and you build these two diagrams, two trees, prerequisite tree and transition tree. It will help you to find the way how to make sure that this solution you're implementing is self-supporting. You know that in Russian there is a proverb So this, is, this tool allows you to avoid this situation. So we would like to get it as much as, as possible, but, but usually we, we're failing. So these tools help you to find the interesting uh, logical compositions of your improvements which make it work for long and many years. Not just while manager stands and pushing this, but self-supporting systems. So, uh, we will not talk about thinking process, it's uh, pretty complex and it's require each diagram requires own session. So, but in order to succeed with the theory of constraints, we need to practice. Yes, it is hard. Using own brain is always hard. You, can involve, you need to involve domain experts if you want to improve the system. You need to understand the system and involve domain experts. It requires a lot of time and energy. Of course, and patience and respect to the people you are working with. Otherwise, you can actually get a lot of conflicts and everything will fall apart and it's time consuming, but it gives you an uh, efficient way with a low cost improvements to get the maximum out of your system. And yes, it's worth doing this, 
because it's a system approach. It's not gut feeling, it's not a fortune telling. It's a systematic approach. So probably you're tired. I don't hear any question, I don't hear anything from you. So let's make a summary. We talked about goals, chance, the weakest, list, uh, weakest link and the constraint. We talked about principles a little bit and we walked through the five focusing steps and mentioning of some thinking processes. If you look to the internet, you, have, you will find tons of materials about the practical application of theory of constraints in different areas of work and life. And it's, uh, it's worth doing this. Give a try to improve your work and life using theory of constraints. Uh, I suggest you to read at least uh, two novels of the Eliyahu Goldrop, that guy I showed in the first. It's a business novel, it's easy to read, and it's inspiring reading before you actually jump into this complex stuff, okay? And try to apply these five focusing steps in your daily work. You will find that uh, it's easy to organize and manage your improvements in the more consistent way. If you have any questions, please ask. If you have any questions afterwards, you can send me an email or find me in Skype. Any questions? This is Eliyahu Goldrod. This is the creator of the theory of constraint and this is his two books. He has a lot of more books, but these two I recommend you to read. And this guy from Australia, he was interpreter or he produced these two books. It's one in English and this is translation of that book. And this uh, gives you a pretty good understanding of thinking processes. And this guy who actually raised the Japan, uh, who improved the, the quality of the system in Japan, and uh, Japan, Japan actually introduced a medal of the Professor Deming, and this is a very big honor if the company got that medal in Japan. So, if you're uh, interested, you can actually have a further reading in here, out of the crisis and a few more links. Thank you for your time. I hope you enjoyed your food. <laughs> Thanks. Hello, привет.